Good afternoon and welcome to our, uh, the last panel of the day today. My name is uh, Florian Bieber from the University of Graz. I'll be moderating this uh, panel. Uh, we'll be looking at the envisaging and the establishment of a post-war order. So uh, unlike many of the other panels which are focused on um, the early phases of the war and the run-up to it, we're looking more at, in a certain way, the, uh, what has been left in its wake or certainly what has been imagined to be left in its wake. Uh, we have um, a number of presenters, and we'll go by the order um, as indicated on the program. Uh, and we'll have uh, Svetlana Suveka, who will be our first speaker, who will be looking at uh, post-imperial projects and imperial identities after 1918, uh, focusing on Bessarabia in particular. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I will skip the general introduction into what post-World War I order signified, and I will make some, some remarks uh, within the text. Uh, the end um, of World War I was marked, besides unprecedented human losses and material devastation, by social revolution and national movements that challenged imperial rules. The path of Bessarabia, the historical region of um, um, Moldova, like that of many other East European regions, was shaped by the political turmoil. The region changed its status from the western gubernia of the dismembered Russian Empire to the eastern province of the Romanian nation-state. The almost monopolist contemporary discourse on the legitimate desire of people inhabiting Bessarabia to become part of Romania does not accommodate various reactions of the locals to the transition from one political regime to another. People acknowledge the economic and social changes that affected their own status, reconsidered their feelings of belonging and identity, adopted new survival strategies and mobility patterns. Between the last days of the empire and the first days of the nation state, various political and social actors representing the old imperial and the new revolutionary elite, as well as the intelligentsia, engaged in the de development of political scenarios for the future of the region. Regardless of the political affiliation and social background, the future was not necessarily perceived as a radical rupture with the past, rather as a mixture of past experience, present confusions, and hopes. In the regional competition for the supremacy of different political scenarios, the role of external factor was crucial. The vanishing of empire at the center, where the Tsar's portraits were replaced overnight by those of the Bolshevik leader, did not mean its immediate disappearance at the periphery. In the condition of the civil war inside Russia, and the confusion on the nature of the future political regime of the former motherland, the White Russians' plan for the restoration of Greater Russia was in line with the pro-Russian perspective for Bessarabia developed by the regional elite. What were the internal as well as external circumstances that motivated its rep representative to act for the return of Bessarabia back to <coughs> Russia, what role the regional elite assumed for the success of the enterprise and how its efforts played back in the region will be examined in the next few minutes. 100 years before the world conflagration, more exactly in 1812, as a result of the war with the Ottomans, Russia annexed the territory between the river Prut and Nister, known uh, as Bessarabia. In the immediate period, before the war, nothing seemed to disturb the harmony of the imperial order at the western periphery of the empire. The portraits of the Tsars were worshipped, the local elite was loyal and obedient, the intelligentsia was little visible, and illiterate Moldovan peasants mixed with the colonized Bulgarians, Germans, Ukrainians, uh, French, and Swiss did not show um, much interest in politics. Only a few hours' visit of the Tsar Nikolai II in May 1912 to celebrate the centenary of the annexation perturbed the daily monotony of the gubernia to remind that there was a motherland who carefully protected its daughter. In 1912, hardly would have anyone envisaged that there will be a war and a revolution and the greater Russia will vanish. In fact, the 1912 episode, as well as the subsequent events, revealed the complex consequences of the simultaneous presence in Bessarabia of the rituals of empire and the nation. 
While Russia marked the centenary of the successful ruling in Bessarabia, the political project of the neighboring young Romanian state focused on the advantages of cultural development of the Romanian majority inhabiting the region looked as a very distant perspective. Both projects did not leave much space for initiative to the local elite, who was persuaded to take sides. Only a group of Moldavian intelligentsia and boyars supported the Romanian perspective at that moment. The illiterate peasants, although they spoke Romanian, were hardly aware that the other side of the river Prut lived the, their connationals. In contrast, the attachment to the empire ensured through its constant presence was expressed through loyalty and subordination based on which the power relations between the center and the periphery were constructed. With the spread of the February 1917 revolution from Petersburg to the most distant corners of the empire, the local elite showed reticence and fear. The greater concern was the peasants' sporadic takeover of the land, the so-called agrarian revolution, which in the region attained moderate proportion comparing to other places. With the Bolshevik size of power in Petrograd, the worries were closely related to the proximity of the Romanian front of the Russian army and the first signs of destabilization of the situation among the soldiers. Uh, in the autumn 1917, when, according to Alan Kramer, Russia's post-war history began while the rest of Europe was still at war, the newly created Bessarabian parliament, Svatul Tseri, and the executive directorate had to face the challenges of a general chaos and economic disaster. The former elite, gradually deprived from the political administrative levers, experienced dispossession and, in certain cases, life threats. Qualifying the newly created regional bodies as emanations of the Bolshevik Revolution, the wealthy doubted whether they will be able to protect their property rights and secure their well-being. In these complex circumstances, the former elite expressed multiple forms of identity that overlapped and interacted, kept boundaries, and defined the insider and the other, the friend and the foe. Self-identification as wealthy, nobles, well-educated, landowners, was reflected upon and exteriorized in relations with the economic and social changes, while the distinctiveness as Russian, and in, a, in some private letter you can find in Russian by name and in soul, was an almost uh, instant expression of loss and nostalgia. The representatives of former elite that served uh, it uh, during the later man of empire, being in fact of Russian, but also of Greek, Ukrainian, Armenian, and Bulgarian ethnic origin, identified uh, themselves as being part of a conventional space that cultivated certain <laughs> values and sentiments of belonging, as well took an active part in the transfer of power from the center to the periphery in exchange of economic and social privileges. In the vacuum of power created in the period of transition from the empire to the nation state, the Kleinist realm initiatives were developed in different parts of Eastern Europe. The short-lived Moldovan independent republic, declared in December 1917, was less an outcome of a separate political project. It was more a reality imposed by the external circumstances, namely the independence of the neighboring Ukraine. The Bessarabian independence, challenged by the unsuccessful Bolshevik attempts to seize power, as well as the lootings of the Russian soldiers as they were passaging Bessarabian territory on their way back home, ended up in April uh, 1918, when the region parliament voted for the union of Bessarabia with Romania. The end of 17, beginning of 1918, was marked by fear and worries expressed in private letters by the wealthy and landowners. The entering of the Romanian army in Bessarabia in January 1918, then the perspective for the region to unite with Romania was seen as a savior. In March 1918, a delegation of the Union of Great Landowners received by the Romanian king in Yash asked for protection of property and personal security. In exchange, their members expressed their readiness to respond with loyalty and support in the ruling of the province as part of Romania. On the eve of the Union, the Romanian Prime Minister, who secretly met in Chisinau, the head of the landowners, ensured the wealthy on the subsequent dissolution of the Bessarabian Parliament after it gave its vote for the Union and reinstalling in power the former elite. Indeed, the fear for the spread of Bolshevism across the Prut River seemed in line with the critique towards the revolutionary clique um, of the legislative body expressed by the landowners. 
Was it the latter believed the promises made by the Romanians is hard to tell. The sources suggest that there was hope that the readiness to switch loyalty will ensure, first of all, the preservation of property rights and social privileges. The abolition of Bessarabian autonomy granted in exchange for the Union in April 1918 was perceived as the end of hope for the former elite. Moreover, the centralization policy as well as the Romanianization of administrative and cultural spheres promoted by Bucharest succeeded in throwing together the representative of the old and the new regional elite against the new administration. The Romanian state began to be perceived by, by, by both groups as a common enemy for those who once were at the different sides of the barricade. In 1923, a Romanian secret police report stated that, quote, the union of Bessarabia with Romania brought the harnessing of the Moldovan element and the removal of ethnic minorities elements from the administration. The union was not only, not only a national act, but an act of political and social justice, which overthrew the undeserved privileges of a minority oligarchy and which gave the precedences to Moldovans who comprise 75% of the entire population." Unquote. It is thus not surprising that uh, immediately after the Union, the old elite was attacked and taunted in the first place, especially in the media. Um, after the abolition of autonomy, the discontent expressed by the Bessarabian deputies from the uh, Romanian parliamentary tribune already was often qualified as separatism, while the seeds of dissatisfaction were explained by the long-term consequences of the imperial policies and diluted and russified population, as well alienated the Romanian national spirit of the majority. Those that were, um, as, the, as, as it said in the source, left out of a new life and cried were neither heard in Bucharest nor in Petersburg, which in the meantime became uh, Petrograd. While the majority remained in Bessarabia and tried to build a new life under the Romanian regime, the others left for Odessa, and then they started from there to propagate against the new regime. The goal of the activities initially were sporadic and with little support, was to free Bessarabia from the Romanian oppression and bring back the region and the Russian rule, regardless of the uncertain Russian future at that moment. Little could have been done uh, from Odessa, and that at that moment, the signals of hope came from Paris, which became not only the corner for hurt feelings, but also the place of great expectations. The post-war conference was viewed both from Paris and other parts of Europe and setting the basis for a peaceful world of nation states. There, the decision making, makers were to redesign the borders of the new Europe so that to Paris run the representatives of the new national governments as well as those at once departing from the empire and never arrived to a nation state. There were Russian political immigrants who encouraged the Bessarabians uh, in Odessa to come to the French capital. With the dismantling of the Russian Empire, they took over the mission of the spreading the long-distance nationalism and boosting nostalgia to the former, for the former um, motherland. So there was a, um, a Bessarabian delegation formed in Odessa, and it aimed to represent the um, Bessarabian population before the conference. And this uh, fight, called in the source um, Bessarabian cause, Bessarabska Idela, was seen as part of a Russian, uh, Russian cause, Ruska Idela, a larger Russian uh, white campaign for the defeat of Bolshevism and the restoration of Russia in its pre-1914 borders. The former Western borderlands were presented as part of the Russia's political, economic, and cultural vital space, without which a democratic Russia would have been hard to be rebuilt. Um, in the condition of the lack of an official delegation on behalf of Russia, the representatives of the Kolchak government used both official and hidden diplomacy uh, channels in order to persuade the decision makers, high rank European politicians, to reject Romania's claim on Bessarabia. And um, for this purpose, the, the plebiscite was proposed um, as a definite solution for the Russian Romanian dispute over this uh, territory, also not on the entire region but only for the four central districts where the majority of the Romanian population lived. 
The pop population of other districts comprised from a, a higher percentage of minorities was uh, automatically qualified as showing anti-Romanian feelings and expressing their will that Bessarabia rejoined Russia. So the idea you know, of plebiscite to be held in Bessarabia was um, um, constantly rejected by the Romanian official representative at the Paris Peace Conference. Um, and in the province already the first integration reforms uh, were launched. Uh, the Bessarabians assumed the role um, or to promote the idea of a plebiscite and of return um, of Bessarabia back to Russia in a propaganda sphere. So we have a um, um, network of, um, of Bessarabians and Russian immigrants built um, based on social ties and personal connections specifically. The network um, evolved into a variegated and diffuse structure in which uh, social, political, um, political and ethnic identification was less important than the willing to contribute to the success of the cause. Moving back and forth across boundaries and um, nations, um, they, they met, met together and um, looked uh, to update their agenda um, and um, also um, persuade not only the decision makers but um, the European public to take stance. And we have um, a range of memoranda and protests uh, that targeted the main political actors uh, while uh, the newspapers, uh, articles, pamphlets um, they were published simultaneously in English and French in London, Geneva, Washington, Paris um, uh, um, were directed towards the wider public. The events in the Paris echoed back in Bessarabia, adding to the contradictory discussions inside the regions, as well to the drama lived by the former elite. The Romanian authorities were trying to catch any sign of Bolshevism among the population. In that condition, the supporters of the Bessarabian cause were hardly keeping up their optimism. Quote from a, a letter, a freely spoken word in Russian gives you the nickname Bolshevik. In order to finally eradicate any allusion to everything is Russian, let's identify what is Russian with Bolshevism, and that is all. You are Russian, then you are Bolshevik, unquote. You understand? So um, 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 the, the, uh, the author is saying that uh, what, what accommodating formula uh, was that? The author is actually um, um, another a head of the Union of Bessarabia Landowners, which I mentioned, uh, um, uh, met earlier as a Romanian king and uh, um, uh, prized the Romanian army entering uh, into Bessarabia. And um, this um, uh, landowner, Sinadino, a well-known um, uh, personality in, uh, in the region, m making efforts to keep the Bessarabians in Paris informed about the state of affairs, uh, he used to travel hundreds of kilometers from Chisinau to Bucharest to meet a second rank French or British representative who would know what the big four in Paris are up to. He then would sneak a parcel with clippings and a letter describing the situation in Bessarabia received in exchange letters from Paris. Those letters uh, kept optimistic him and others like him who once served the Russian Empire and who hoped that there will be a life after Paris. Besides, uh, briefly, I don't have time to, to say a lot, but besides the landowners, there were uh, former public servants, teachers, and lawyers who, in exchange of money, were encouraged to refuse taking oaths to the Romanian regime. While in Paris, such acts were presenting as an expression of high patriotism towards the Russian motherland, at whom the so-called resistance was taking dramatic turns for the people at the limit of subsistence that fell between the devil and the deep sea. The contradictory debate in Paris, interpreted as either favorable to the Romanian or the Russian side, continued to element the state of incertitude and anxiety in the region. Well, the future nevertheless belonged to the nation state, and on October the 28, 1920, the Paris Peace Treaty recognized Bessarabia as part of Romania, so, the uh, so there was a final solution for the dispute. The efforts um, um, then to return the Bessarabia back to Russia um, proved to be a lost cause. Well, uh, a series of circumstances um, worked against this cause, uh, such as little unity among the, the um, immigrants, um, 
but mostly international circumstances, uh, the gradual give up of an anti-Bolshevist rhetoric um, that was um, kept by the great powers and that give life to this uh, pro-Russian pro um, um, Russian white propaganda and, and the, the plans to restore um, Russia, but also the, the, the way Romania was seen uh, as an important play in the anti-Bolshevik uh, um, um, uh, plan, uh, but mainly on the uh, Hungarian front. So the concessions over the Bessarabia um, questions were made. But still, uh, this, this um, ad hoc um, scenario uh, had a series of consequences on the short and the long term, um, especially mobilization of the former elite as well um, as well the um, anti-Romanian feeling, uh, feelings at home, um, the counterbalance of the Romanian um, uh, delegation in Paris and um, um, those arguments and means of propaganda were later borrowed by the Soviet propaganda machine, and they were very um, um, so. Uh, so the implementation uh, went forward um, um, uh, in the post-war period. And um, the last, but the, but most, not least, um, uh, it generated uh, an antagonistic narrative in which not only Russia and Romania took part, but also local uh, local uh, actors, which was uh, hardly taken into account by, by um, in historiography. And um, um, that diplomatic confrontation continued as a symbolic confrontation uh, later in the region, which is, um, I would say, present and until today. And uh, to conclude, um, just a few sentences, um, this case study on the post-war Bessarabia, which traveled from the Russian Empire to the Romanian nation state in a, uh, complex circumstances, showed that the reconfiguration of East European regional borders was seen differently from the region than, than from, the, from Paris. Um, also, the alternative scenario clashed with nation state perspective enforced from Paris, thus proving to be unsuccessful. It was a reflection of the pro-Russian attachment mixed with anti-Romanian feelings, strong backed by the anti-Bolshevik character of the decision makers at the Paris Peace Conference. Romania was neither ready to embrace within a new state the privileged elite, former privileged elite, uh, or the ethnic minorities, which due to the Bolshevik threat were ex expected to show an automatic loyalty to the um, new regime. The nation state uh, should thus be seen less the, as a predestined linear path, rather as a eventful process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, this contribution um, really drew our attention to that the transition from uh, regions belonging to multinational uh, empires to nation states was uh, certainly not a foregone conclusion and was a process which, at least from the perspective of the actors at the time, was not at all predictable in the way one might be tempted to look at it in retrospect as a kind of normal process which occurred uh, in the closing of, of the war. And this, I think, uncertainty uh, which it entailed, I think we've uh, heard uh, very much about and I'm probably uh, worthwhile discussing also in a comparative perspective. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Andre Kola who will be looking um, at the Czechoslovak case uh, and uh, the Czechoslovak gendarmerie and the creation of the Republic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, interesting conference. Uh, my contribution deals with uh, uh, the role of the Czechoslovak Gendarmerie Force in the process of creation of independent Czechoslovakia after the First World War. Uh, the historians who dealt with uh, this period of, of the beginnings of the, of the independent Czechoslovakia uh, usually focused mainly on uh, political and diplomatic activities as well as uh, military operations of Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak army uh, in the first post-war years. Uh, but the role of uh, other armed forces was uh, a little bit neglected. According to my personal opinion, um, mainly the gendarmerie uh, deserves the attention of historians because of several factors. Mm, uh, because um, in the moment uh, when the Czechoslovak state was declared, it had uh, in fact no army. 
the Czech volunteer, volunteer units uh, in, in exile were still fighting against the central powers on the fronts and also the Czech and Slovak soldiers of the Austro-Hungarian army um, were slowly retiring from the fronts. So at the very beginning, in the first days of the Republic, there were only the gendarmes and uh, some uh, volunteer paramilitary troops in the Czechoslovakia. And the gendarmerie was also the only one uh, force uh, that was constantly present in uh, in all the area of the historical Czech lands. Now I'm not speaking about uh, Slovakia, where the situation was a little bit complicated. The Slovakia was still controlled by Hung by Hungarian troops, and it was uh, fully controlled by uh, the Czech Czechoslovak institutions um, in the second half of 1919. Uh, during 1918, uh, some uh, Czech politicians were already preparing to take power in the moment of expected downfall of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and uh, some uh, gendarmerie commissioned officers were involved to these plans, uh, including General Václav Hlezáč on the picture, uh, the commander of uh, gendarmerie in, in Bohemia, in Prague. Mm, uh, uh, the coup d'etat um, in Prague took place uh, on um, um, October 98, 1918, uh, and it happened suddenly, it happened earlier than it was expected. Um, so the situation was quite complicated, um, and uh, the Czech political representation needed to improvise. Uh, thanks to uh, General Hezaj and his fellow officers, um, they managed to or organize a quick transfer of uh, Hungarian and German uh, gendarmerie troops, uh, about 700 men, out of the capital city. So Prague was uh, easy, easily, quite easily controlled by the Czech officials, and uh, the Hungarian and German forces uh, couldn't be used to restore, restore orders restore order by uh, the pro-Habsburg officials in Prague. Um, uh, one day after the coup d'etat, uh, General Kezak was appointed the commander-in-chief of a newly founded uh, Czechoslovak gendarmerie, and uh, he immediately issued an order uh, to all gendarmerie stations in the Republic uh, to accept the Czechoslovak National Committee in Prague, to accept its authority and to ignore all orders from Vienna. Um, uh, the overwhelming majority of the gendarmes really entered the Czechoslovak service, um, so the gendarmerie became the first and uh, technically the only one uh, armed force that was uh, adopted uh, by the Czechoslovak state without any significant personal or structural changes. Uh, on the other side, uh, the army needed to be uh, rebuilt, and, uh, rebuilt and reformed, reformed after, after the coup d'etat. Uh, there were um, significant personal changes in the army. Uh, in gendarmerie, the situation was uh, um, quite different. There was um, uh, higher personal continuity as I will uh, mention later. Uh, the first problem occurred uh, almost immediately in the borderland with Germany and Austria, where four so-called German provinces uh, were established uh, that declared their loyalty to, to Austrian Republic. And uh, these four provinces tried, tried to uh, found their own gendarmerie corps. And um, some uh, German-speaking gendarmes from the Czech lands uh, joined the, these forces. Um, but the, the, the provinces were um, occupied um, um, quite peacefully without any bigger battle or, or bloodshed by Czechoslovak army and gendarmerie uh, till January 1919. Uh, but suddenly, um, uh, some um, more um, more serious conflict occurred. Uh, there were border wars um, um, in Slovakia and Silesia, 
Hey, um, as I have already mentioned, Slovakia was uh, controlled by the Hungarian troops. Um, at, the, at the end of 1918, first gendarmerie units were sent to, to Slovakia uh, to take control over the area. Um, at this moment, there were no Czechoslovak army troops yet. Um, uh, so, so the gendarmes um, uh, were forced to withdraw by, um, uh, by overnumbering uh, Hungarian troops. And um, uh, the Slovakia was later controlled um, at the end of 1919 after uh, uh, military intervention on Czecho of Czechoslovak and uh, Romanian armies against Hungary. In Silesia, uh, the situation was quite specific because there were uh, both uh, German and Polish border claims, and mainly on the, on the frontier with Poland, uh, uh, the conflicts occurred. Uh, um, gendarmerie stations and Czechoslovak institutions were often attacked by Polish paramilitary troops. Um, this ended um, in the middle of 1920 by um, uh, by the decision of uh, Paris Peace Conference, uh, when the Silesian uh, area was divided uh, between, between uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Uh, the post-war uh, situation also uh, led to uh, social problems. And um, at the end of 1920, uh, there was an attempt of communist push in Czechoslovakia in uh, some uh, industrial cities. Um, it's interesting that uh, many soldiers, uh, mainly former Czechoslovak legionaries from the war and uh, younger rec recruits, uh, joined uh, the rebels, while uh, the majority of the gendarmes stayed uh, loyal to the Republic. It's important to explain that uh, the gendarmerie uh, in Austria was um, formed as strictly a political force and uh, this tradition of uh, no political influence uh, in the force uh, continued, uh, continued uh, even in the Republican era. Uh, uh. I would also like to mention the mobilization of Czechoslovak armed forces uh, in autumn, autumn 1921 against uh, Hungary, uh, where um, uh, Charles Habsburg tried, tried to regain the, the Hungarian throne. Uh, the Czechoslovak officials reacted uh, by declaring the mobilization of the army, uh, but also the gendarmerie and other armed forces uh, played an important role um, uh, when organizing uh, the mobilization. According to the archival records from this, from this time, uh, the gendarmerie was highly credited for, for the um, uh, smooth um, uh, organizing of the, of the mobilization. In the first uh, year of the Czechoslovak independence, uh, uh, the gendarmerie also had to deal with uh, uh, many serious internal problems. Uh, at first, uh, there was a significant lack of qualified personnel. Um, the situation was um, uh, much more uh, serious than in the army, because the army could rely on new recruits and um, uh, the commanding uh, posts or in the army uh, were often uh, held by former Czechoslovak legionaries from the First World War who had uh, uh, military experience, who had war experience. Uh, but on the other side, the gendarmerie um, was based uh, only on volunteers and there, there were not enough uh, qualified volunteers in the first years. Um, for this reason, uh, the gendarmerie was uh, much more permissive to uh, German or Hungarian uh, uh, staff than it was in the army. Um, uh, many, they, uh, mainly German-speaking gendarmes uh, uh, were still uh, in service, uh, or even if uh, they were not able to speak Czech fluently. Uh, this fact was often criticized by Czech uh, nationalist political parties and uh, 
ten nationalized uh, newspaper. In the first years after the war, there was also a significant drift towards uh, democratization of the force because uh, uh, the gendarmerie uh, was organized as, um, as um, a military force. Um, its members uh, needed uh, the permission of, of their commanders when they wanted to marry, for example, or uh, when they wanted to live in their our house uh, outside uh, the garrison. Uh, after the war, uh, there were attempts to reform the gendarmerie as a civilian police, form, police force, but um, the new regulations uh, issued in 1920 uh, confirmed the um, military organization of the force uh, because um, the gendarmerie command uh, was afraid that uh, the reform of the force uh, may lead to uh, strengthening the political influence uh, to, to the gendarmes. Um, on the picture we can see General Karel Vichital, the longest serving commander of Czechoslovak Gendarmerie, who led the force uh, uh, for almost 10 years and uh, who had uh, uh, the main uh, credit for um, uh, consolidating the situation of the force after the First World War. Uh, at the end, I'd like to mention the relationship uh, between gendarmerie and the army. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, um, in the gendarmerie there was uh, higher personal continuity, there were no significant personal changes. Uh, um, uh, on the other side, um, the army uh, was reformed after the war. Uh, the army was quite popular, popular by, by the Czech uh, public um, because the army was led uh, by, by the former legionaries who, who had fought for Czechoslovak independence in the war. On the other side, uh, the gendarmerie was often criticized for, uh, for the number of uh, German-speaking gendarmes or uh, for employing former Austro-Hungarian officers. Um, this is uh, one of the reasons uh, why in the um, uh, books and articles uh, uh, from the interwar uh, period uh, there uh, uh, which uh, dealt with, uh, uh, with the coup d'etat and with the beginnings of uh, independent Czechoslovak Republic, uh, the Gendarmerie is usually only barely mentioned uh, and um, uh, the attention of the authors uh, usually um, focused may, mainly on the army. Uh, the popular image of uh, Czechoslovak gendarmerie uh, became improving um, as late as in the middle of uh, 1930s uh, when the gendarmerie uh, was facing the growing aggressivity of uh, uh, German uh, Nazis in the Czechoslovak borderland because Czechoslovakia had um, uh, over 3 million uh, German-speaking inhabit German inhabitants during the interwar period. Uh, but um, the problem of uh, the sec security situation in 1930s uh, uh, would already be uh, perhaps um, a topic for, uh, for a self-standing uh, study. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention, attention. and uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them in the discussion at the end. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, case study, which looks at one institution over a longer period of time, um, and of course shows us to, to some degree the, how the, this crucial moment of 1819 sets the path of these institutions for a longer period. So this is a, a critical juncture in many ways, which provides for opportunities, but also sets the pattern in the interwar period. Now, uh, our next presenter is Natasha Mishkovic, who will be uh, taking a more a broader perspective, um, uh, and a global perspective in a certain way, um, looking at the way in which uh, the concepts of the right to self-determination uh, communism and race interact, and of course, in that, that sense, uh, 
extend beyond Europe uh, and uh, this concept, how this works outside of Europe or doesn't work outside of Europe. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Florian. Seen in a global post-colonial light, the assassination of Sarajevo was an act of terrorism by a group of local freedom fighters directed against an imperial power. Notwithstanding the high price it cost, Mlada Bosna's aim was ultimately achieved because the right of self-determination of the South Slavs came to be honored by the, in the post-war order of Versailles. The non-European peoples colonized by those European empires which won the war were not as lucky, despite all their sacrifices as soldiers and taxpayers. They had to wait for self-determination of um, they had to wait for self-determination until after World War II. In my talk, I will reflect on the role of race and communism in the creation of the post-war order and how it affected the history of Yugoslavia in the course of the 20th century. The talk is divided in four parts. The first will be Yugoslavism and the right of self-determination of people. The second, the right of self-determination of peoples and race. The third, the right of self-determination of peoples and communism. And the last, Yugoslavia and the right of self-determination of peoples after World War II. I come to my first, Yugoslavism and the right of self-determination of peoples. As Dejan Jokic has correctly pointed out in the introduction to his volume on Yugoslavism, I cite, Yugoslavism was a fluid concept understood differently at different times by different Yugoslav nations, leaders, and social groups. End of citation. The idea of a Yugoslav state never entered the third state of Miroslav Hroch's model of nation building when mass movements would take the process to its ultimate revolutionary fulfillment the Yugoslav state entered into realization directly from the second stage, supported mainly by patriotic committees and parties who had propagated the idea of a Yugoslav state either within the Habsburg Empire or in unification with the kingdoms of Serbia and Montenegro. We have heard a lot of this um, during this, to, uh, this day today. It was the breakdown of the Habsburg Empire which necessitated a post-war order and that mo at that moment, the model of a new South Slav state merging the territories of the Habsburg South Slavs with Serbia and Montenegro suddenly became acceptable to all parties concerned, including the winning big powers, which up to that moment had not lost their interest in the continuity of the Habsburg Empire. The turning point had come about in 1917, when the United States of America entered the war on the side of the Entente powers and when the February and October revolutions took place in Russia. The emerging new world leaders, Woodrow Wilson on the American side and Vladimir Ilyich Lenin on the Russian side, set a new agenda and on this agenda the right of self-determination of peoples turned out to be a crucial issue. Only now it became clear that the Habsburg Empire would be dismantled and that its peoples had to act fast in order to prevent others from grabbing their territories and to determine the status of their nations for themselves. At the Paris Peace Conference in January 1919, a Yugoslav delegation was accepted to take part under the official name of Delegation of the Kingdom of Serbia. The convening parties, in other words, the winning powers, tolerated that this delegation included members coming from the defeated Habsburg Empire and that it claimed to speak for a new state by the name of Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. As Andrei Mitrovic put it, I cite, the most significant legacy of the Great War was that the right to national self-determination had won, at least in theory, over the principles of historic rights. End of citation. The Yugoslav delegation's claim was accepted that, I cite again Andrei Mitrovic, that Serbia had fought for the rights to equality and self-determination of peoples. End of citation. 
and the founding of the new kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes was agreed on. This was a consequence of the influence of the United States, but it did not mean that previously existing secret treaties among powers would not be valid anymore and affect the peace and post-war agreements signed in Paris. Nor did it mean that the right of self-determination of peoples was accepted as a general rule, although from a European perspective it looked as if it was. And this brings me to my second point the right of self-determination of peoples and race. The new European national states, founded on the ruins of the Habsburg and Romanov empires, raised worldwide expectations that this principle, which had, not been a, which had been a hot political issue throughout the 19th century, would now be accepted as a universal one and be adopted into the charter of the newly built League of Nations. The idea of nationhood had long spread beyond Europe among the colored peoples of the European overseas colonies and among Afro-Americans in the United States. They all were excluded from full citizenship, not as much by wealth, education, history and or language as by race. At the outbreak of World War I, non-white leaders soon observed that the imperialist white world was tearing itself apart and they saw the moment coming. On the other hand, the European powers and the US relied on colored manpower to fill the ranks of their armies on the European battleground and beyond. I think there is a panel going on in the next room um, dealing with this, which again enhanced non-white demands for equal rights. When US President Wilson entered the war scene and responded to Lenin's call for unconditional peace based on the right of self-determination in his programmatic speech before the Congress in Washington in January 1918, he attracted the worldwide hopes of the pacifist and anti-imperialist opposition, including those of the non-whites in the colonies and in the US. But these hopes were shattered very soon. Woodrow Wilson, a Southerner very much aware of internal political implications in the US, resiled from accepting Lenin's challenge, challenging call because of race. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, he showed, or was made to show, his racist convictions in, actu in accord with most European imperial powers. The right of self-determination of peoples was openly denied to colored delegations who had vigorously fought for it, only minor concessions being made to some of the British colonies. The League of Nations turned out to be more of an instrument designed to sustain the European great powers' control of the colonies than anything else. Not many pacifists, abolitionists or anti-imperialists, white or colored, had seriously considered a union with the communists until the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 but now they were bitterly disappointed, even more so in view of the fact that colored peoples had made huge sacrifices in the war, fighting for their imperial motherland or the US, and financing with their tax money a cause which was not theirs. If their freedom movements had not yet reached Throsfast phase three, this was the moment when it switched. And this will be my third point the right of self-determination of peoples and communism. It was also the moment when they started to think of collaborating with the Bolsheviks. Communists, in their fight against imperialism and in contrast to the racist policy of the Paris peacemakers, celebrated the brotherhood of peoples regardless of race. In 1920, communists from all over the world discussed how to overthrow imperialism, first in Moscow at the Second Comintern Congress, later in Baku at the Congress of the Peoples of the East. There were two diverging opinions. One claimed that an alliance between the workers' movement and the oppressed people, how they were called in, in the jargon of the time, the oppressed peoples of the colonies, should bring about the socialist world revolution by force which was supported by Stalin. The other, which was supported by Lenin, 
did not believe that such an alliance would be strong enough to achieve its aims. It recommended an alliance with the bourgeois opposition, namely the national elites of the colonies. After Wilson's failure, non-communist activists agreed to support the Conference Against Imperialism, which was organized in 1927 in Brussels by the Comintern media specialist Willy Münzenberg and the similarly colorful South Asian, Germany-based communist Virendrana Chattopadhyaya called Chatto. The organizers won the support of prominent people such as Nobel Prize winner uh, Nobel Prize winners Albert Einstein and Romain Roland to serve as patrons of the Congress, alongside British Labour Party leader George Lansbury and Sung Lee Chingling, the influential widow of Kuomintang founder Sun Yat-sen. Also, the later Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was present in Brussels, making his first steps as an internationalist. The 1927 Brussels Congress and a visit to the Soviet Union in the following year were crucial for Nehru's formation as a future global leader. Here, he first encountered the idea of forming an Asiatic Federation, which would lead into his Afro-Asian Solidarity Initiative and ultimately to the Bandung Conference and to non-alignment. The Soviet initiative to include non-socialists into its revolutionary strategy, however, came to an end soon after when Stalin enforced his claim for power by the end of the 1920s. I come to my fourth point and last point. Yugoslavia and the right of self-determination of peoples after World War II. Only in 1945, the right of self-determination was finally incorporated into the Charter of the United Nations. The newly decolonized nations of Asia and Africa discovered and used the United Nations as a means to fend off superpower pressure. African and Native Americans within the US, and of course South Africans, had to wait several more decades for their equal civil rights. At the same time, the Balkans were divided into new spheres of interest. Greece was to belong to the Western sphere, the rest to the Soviet camp. Yugoslavia emerged from the ashes of a, of a world war for a second time, now in the socialist version. The CPY's self-assured politics in the Balkans soon made it a target to Stalin. The expulsion from the common form followed in 1948. Tito had repeatedly stressed the importance of self-determination of the Yugoslav peoples, but now his rule was as much in danger as the independence of Yugoslavia as a state. In its struggle for survival, the CPYs rediscovered Lenin's approval of strategic cooperation with non-communist anti-imperialists. Yugoslavia's term in the United Nations Security Council 1949 and 50 offered the opportunity to get to know the high-ranking delegation of India, the rising, Asian, uh, the, the rising Asian regional power led by Nehru. Stalin's death in March 1953 was another turning point. When under his successor, Nikita Khrushchev, Moscow restarted to send friendly signs to Belgrade, Tito felt safe enough to retreat from the Balkan Pact, which he had signed shortly before Stalin's death and which would have forced him to enter NATO. He instead focused on new allies in Asia, Africa and the Middle East, among the non-socialist countries that was not the communist ones as he had first hoped for. Hosting the Brioni meeting of July 1956 and the Belgrade conference of September 1961 was not only a move on the global scene for the peaceful coexistence of nations and against the bipolar world of the Cold War, but also a propaganda move within the communist world stating that, were, uh, that there were more paths to socialism than the one Moscow had prescribed. And this brings me to my conclusions. In this light, the history of anti-imperialism and the concept of self-determination of peoples link Gavrilo Princip with socialist Yugoslavia's non-alignment. The antagonism of the two superpowers emerging after World War I turned around the question how to apply the right of self-determination of peoples. 
the US struggled with the question of race, and the government sided with the old European powers because it was not ready to solve the issue for good. The communist world was split along the question how to deal with non-communist anti-imperialism. In the early 1920s, the Soviet Union looked by far the more progressive power, until the moment when Stalin started to defame, con to defame contacts with bourgeois anti-imperialism as treason of the communist cause. After the Yugoslav split with Stalin in 1948, the Leninist credo of cooperation with non-communists, colored or not, uncovered as the perfect strategy for Tito, who needed strong partners to escape superpower pressure. He found them in Nehru of India and in Nasser of Egypt, two of the most charismatic freedom fighters of the decolonized third world. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as our fourth speaker is um, not with us, uh, at least not visibly so, um, uh, we will be moving to our uh, comments and, uh, and discussion uh, section at this particular point in time. Um, I think what we heard from, from uh, Natasha Mishkovich is, is in a certain way looking at it from a, from a kind of, not just in terms of global scope, but also in terms of long durée, kind of what, is, what is the consequences of the end of, of, of World War I, um, not just uh, for, for the region, but really well beyond that in terms of the ideas which were launched, the unfulfilled promises maybe, which came up and uh, which then uh, I think also influenced, shaped these movements later on, the self-determination movements after the, the Second World War across the world. So I'd like to open the floor. I'm going to collect questions. Please introduce yourself briefly and uh, ask a brief question or comment. So please, gentlemen there in the yellow polo shirt. Right. Joris uh, Yanakopoulos from Queen Mary, University, Queen Mary University of London. I have a quick comment, hopefully it makes sense, and, and a factual question. What well, the comment is in a way it draws from the first and the th last paper. And uh, in, in, in brief terms is this. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if there is an interesting tension between the first and the last account in terms of how do we understand national self-determination. I have in mind here uh, accounts of the globalization of national self-determination after the First World War. One can think of Erez Manele's work on uh, the Wilsonian book moment that have been criticized as being overly, as it were, diffusionist stories. And perhaps they do not allow us to uh, focus on particular moments in time and uh, see or unearth regional visions of autonomy that were, as it were, between the nation state as a form and, and imperial sort of forms of organization. Well, that's the comment. And now a more a factual question to Natasha Mishkovic. Thank you very much for the paper. Um, you talked about the League of Nations as effectively legitimizing a form of European great power rule, and I have no issues about that. I'm just wondering, um, wouldn't you see the League of Nations also as a stage where all sorts of national or not national groupings had a voice and they were able to, to use all sorts of different languages of self-determination uh, to appeal to, as it were, a more global public. And I have in mind here sort of recent works on the mandate system that see the League of Nations as a stage of that sort. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions in the room, we'll collect a few. Yes, please. Uh, Jano Ustekam, Munich. I have a question on the Bess Arabia case. Um, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bess Arabia put the condition for joining the Union of Romania to be it a federal order and then uh, refrain from that condition later on. And you focused uh, on alternatives, integration, separation of Bess Arabia. And my question would be, was the federal feder federalization a viable alternative to this um, politics? And uh, another question to, to uh, Natasha Mishkovic. It was the alignment of Tito with the Indian um, powers. Um, what religion and the Muslim um, minority and in, 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 uh, Muslim population played a role with regard to this alignment? 
Okay, thank you very much. I think there was a question all the way in the back of the room. No? Yes, last last stroke. Yeah, Karl Bittke. Is he right? And then we got, yes. We Karl Bittke from Germany. Um, just uh, to Natasha, as you mentioned, this um, <coughs> alliance um, between national self-determination and communism, um, I think um, you, you presented in a quite bourgeois way in, in so far as, as the backbone <coughs> of this, um, uh, this alliance is, is of course, uh, the question of possession of um, uh, of land, of uh, social hierarchies, and so on. Uh, so it's not it's not only about self determination. It's about concrete uh, possession of land, for example. And then um, in U.S. picture is implicit that uh, let's say an trans international oil company in Nigeria is the same as. Uh, a Muslim landlord uh, who has too much uh, land or uh, so, uh, you understand? No. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you say the, the inter um, colonial, this uh, construct, is, is this a construction, this um, comparison between uh, Eastern or Southeastern European uh, right of self-determination from Ottoman Empire or from Habsburg Empire uh, as the same as uh, the British imperialism in Africa or Third World? Yeah, because then you, you say uh, this um, uh, um, Turkish uh, landlord is in the same way uh, not a part of our society, is something alien, something strange as the British oil companies in Nigeria. And the question is, uh, is this really comparable? Okay. Um, I think there weren't that many British oil colonies, uh, companies at the time, but, uh, but, uh, but let's just take it metaphorically. Um, I think there was a question in the front. Uh, yes. Gentlemen, yeah, and then first row. Uh, Carson Fidelius from Denmark. Well, it just uh, struck me regarding this question about uh, uh, Yugoslavia trying to build up some sort of anti colonial or post colonial league. Well, I think that uh, Cuba also formed part of it, and that one of the last acts of Tito, when he was alive, was to um, go against Castro's proposal of the non-alignment movement aligning with uh, the Eastern Bloc. But I would like your comment to that, because I think Cuba is a particular case in this respect. Okay, thank you. Although I would ask us all to stay. I mean, in the at least in the somewhat in the time period we're we're focusing. Please, uh, first row. Afterwards, we'll give a first round of answers, and then we can have a second round of questions. Hvala lijepo, ja sam Albert Bing iz Hrvatske institute za povijest i sam se bavim inače problematikom samodrženja naroda, prije svega u kontekstu nastanga i raspada Jugoslavijske države. I daću samo nekoliko opaske koje su relevantne za vaše izlaganje i uz to ću vam postaviti dva pitanja. Prije svega interesira me, s obzirom na kontroverze koje su povezane uz taj pojam koji ima politološko, pravno i povijesno značenje, koja su vaša saznanja o percepciji, znači masa na koje se treba odnositi primjena narodnog samoodređenja, a koja su se djelovali kao vojnici u Prvom svjetskom ratu? Daću vam nekoliko primjera. Jedan od hrvatskih vojnika koji je kasnije postao ugledni književnik i povjesničar Josip Horvat piše da je prvi puta čuo za samoodređenje naroda nakon što je zarobljen u velikoj brusiljeroj ofenzivi u lipnju 1916. godine i kaže to je bila strašno konfuzna ideja koju nismo potpunosti shvatili jer je bila kontradiktorna sa recimo nacionalnim aspiracijama Hrvata odnosu na Mađare. Znamo da je Mađarska nakon primjena i koncepta narodnog samodrđenja bila vjerojatno jedna od rekli država koja je s vanjske strane svoje granice imala mađarsku populaciju što se dakle kosilo sa samim načelom. Tada je Josip Horvat koncept narodnog samodrđenja nazvao kvadraturom kruga na istu formulaciju se pozvao 15. godina kasnije i hrvatski književni Miroslav Krleža koji je u sklopu Jugoslavije, dakle koja se također pozivala na princip narodnog samodređenja, ponovo traži narodno samodređenje ovog puta za Hrvate od Jugoslavije. Naime, problem je o tome što je narodno samodređenje povezano sa pravom na ocijepljenje Josip Brostito primjerice koji je zastupao koncept narodnog samodređenja u jednom intervju nekoliko godina prije smrti je rekao da svaki narod Jugoslavi ima pravo na samodređenje pod uvjetom da ne traži ocepljenje. 
što je takako kontradiktorno. Drugim rečima, ono što me interesira je nešto što se pojavlja u okolnosti prvog svjetskog rata, odnosi se na percepciju ili recepciju narodnog samozđenja u narodnim masama. Primjerice, kad se bune mornari monarhije u veljači 918. u Boki Kotrskoj, tada ističu lenjinsko načelo samodržena naroda i pozivaju se na njega, kao što se poziva i na vilsunijanske 14 točaka, uključujući narodno samodređenje. Da kako njima nije bilo previše jasno što to točno znači, ali su se svi na to pozivali, prednjevajući da njihove nacionalne elite nešto predstavljaju u tom kontekstu. Kasnije to je zazvalo mnogo razočaranja. Dakle, pitanje se odnosi da li imate nekih saznanja, kako je, da li postoje neke komparativne studije koje bi uhvatile što je uopće bila percepcija tog jednog uvjetno govorići kontroverznog načela koji i danas izaziva rekao bih smutnju u međunarodnim odnosima sve do slučaja Južnog Sudana koji se zadnji ocijepio pozivajući se na koncept narodnog samodrženja. Hvala. Thank you very much. We've got quite a few questions about self-determination on our agenda. And I think I guess maybe just to kind of throw in something for the presenters Uh, in answering it is, is, I think, one of the striking questions is that the understanding of self-determination was also exclusively as meaning the external, what is now known as, as external self-determination, i.e. independence or, or joining another country, rather than internal self-determination, i.e. autonomy, for example. Uh, and I think what we see also in the case of uh, what, we, what we heard is that, um, in fact, autonomy or federal arrangements were not the default option of the post-World War I arrangement, the only form of internal self-determination were minority rights, and those were the famed uh, and not very successful minority regime, uh, minority rights regime or minority treaties of the interwar period, which certainly uh, did not deliver really some effective form of, um, of internal self-determination. And I think these are interesting questions which, which come up from the presentation. I will give the floor to the presenters in reverse order, so Natasha, you're mm -hmm. first. Am I first? Yes, you're first. Okay, good. Thank you for all these questions. I will try to tackle them. I'm not sure whether I will be able to answer all of them because my focus in my research was actually not uh, World War I, um, but the relationship between the founders of non-alignment. So um, how did Tito, Nero and Nasser come together and form this sort of alliance? Why did they do it? And why was Tito interesting for for, for third world leaders. That was the quite question which I was interested in. So the question on, on self-determination um, self of peoples is, is, so, uh, is a central point in my research, but at the same time one which is on the sideline. Uh, and I look at it from the perspective of the 50s when they founded, uh, when they signed uh, the Brioni Agreement, or uh, before that when um, Nehru and Schoenlai signed uh, the Panchila Agreement. So my perception of self-determination of peoples would be, I would start from the perception of um, disagreement uh, of self-determination of Panchila. Uh, so this would be the right of of um, um, of um, the. the um, um, f um, peaceful coexistence and how to achieve it. This means mainly uh, the, the right of non-interference from from other pow from neighboring powers and non-interference in, non in economical matters, in political matters, in internal affairs of of uh, autonom uh, of um, sovereign states. So this is the perception I depart from. Um, What I did when I studied this uh, question for, for this uh, talk was to look at the history of, of, of um, self-determination, of the right of self-determination somewhat departing from the ideals of the French Revolution or so, or the, 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 the United States um, Independence um, Declaration. So that was about the time when this uh, notion of self-determination of, of peoples as a people and then uh, it came about. And the question, of course, is which is highly um, controversial, is what makes a people? So the answers are very diverse, and I cannot give you an answer in this case, uh, in this sense. Um, I, can, uh, I hope, Carl Bitke, that um, this also somehow answers your question about my bourgeois um, <laughs> approach to the question. In fact, it's, it's the Panchila I depart from, which was about um, the, 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 the regulation of power spheres uh, in post-colonial Asia, in fact 
which um, Tito um, instantly jumped upon, um, which uh, I found was something which had been acute within the communist uh, states before. So when um, when China emerged as as a, as, a, as an independent state. Um, it um, was very much aware of how to um, um, retain its power and how to make, um, how to position itself within the communist movement, namely how to escape control of Moscow or how to face trial and uh, Moscow um, um, endeavors to control also China. So they didn't want it. And um, on the other side, um, Nehru, who wanted to um, have friendly relations um, with China as a huge neighbor on the northern and eastern border, um, um, he departed from the Gandhi's view of friendly coexistence. So even within this movement or within this non-aligned movement, uh, perceptions of what self-determination of peoples and what friendly, uh, peaceful co um, um, coexistence mean were very diverse. And um, because um, the Chinese used it in a different way as, as the Indians used it. And uh, the Chinese tricked the Indians into this um, agreement and then um, uh, Nehru in the end lost his face. And this is where the cooperation with Tito also came to an end uh, for some time. And um, on the other hand, when um, Khrushchev started to uh, enter the scene, he, uh, wanted to make, uh, he wanted to make himself very different from from um, from his predecessor, and he also tried to find a way how to make this, how to achieve this. And when he consolidated his power, he then entered the international scene to gain control over over his neighbors. And he again um, tried to do it with um, with uh, um, uh, with approaching uh, bourgeois states such as India, because the Indian elite was may be called a, a bourgeois one, um, and Chinese, the Chinese would be, a, China, uh, would be a, a communist one. So he tried to find a way how to, how to um, make himself believable. Um, how can he make himself friendly to these um, Asian states? And it was, again, the right of uh, the, 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 the notion of peaceful coexistence, which offered him a chance to, to, to find a, um, uh, like an umbrella notion for all these states to come to an agreement together, at least for the time being. And then the next steps were not that clear at that moment. Um, but now going back to uh, World War I and what it meant during World War I, of course the, um, the right of self-determination was, was a very elitist view of, a very elitist conception of um, how an, a state should be organized. And I, I very well believe that uh, soldiers on the front somewhere, when they first heard of it, they were either thrilled um, but uh, certainly also confused that it was not clear what it could mean. It could mean many things. So it could mean uh, self-determination for Croatia. It could also mean South Slav um, self-determination. And this, yes, because they would say that uh, we have a common language and uh, we speak um, and, and we, in fact, we are brothers. So, and departing from this notion also of, of, of pan-Slavism. Which was then, which was also um, a treat of um, a trait of, of um, uh, from Russia, how to unite um, the same people again. So, what is a people is again the crucial question. And I'm a historian. I, I'm not. A, I'm not a lawyer, and I look at it from from the historical way. So, I'm really interested in the in the development how it is. Um, this was used. Uh, and adapted to s uh, different situations and not so far what it really meant. So it meant different things at different times. And in this, I think um, Dejan Jokic is also very much right in his notions. Um, League of Nations. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question, but I can recommend some literature on this because, again, uh, I mainly um, relied on the book by Mark Mazover on Unenchanted Palace and on the works of um, Paul Gordon Lauren, who has really studied the, 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 the um, protocole. Um, 
the protocols of, of um, the sessions when the uh, League of Nations was founded and um, he very much in detail shows how the Japanese delegation tried to force the, the, the Americans or tried to force Wilson into um, agreeing on uh, the, the universal, uh, universal right of self-determination of peoples. And the, the, the Japanese in that moment were um, supported by, by all the other delegations. And as far as I'm aware, uh, it was the, uh, the Indians who got some kind of uh, small, um, um, small uh, um, enlargements of, of, of a small sort of very um, restricted form of, of autonomy or, or rather um, a right to... to um, um, to give their views, but they were not content. They did not get autonomy for for the Raj, for 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 the for the Indian part. Nor did they um, um, uh, nor did they achieve some kind of independence as as Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia did, and that was, that was what they wanted, and they didn't get it because they were not white, and that is the crucial point. Um, Muslims um, in the non-alignment with India. Uh, this is indeed a very interesting question um, because when I started to research on um, in, in, on in detail how uh, Yugoslav um, diplomats and politicians started to approach um, Asian um, delegations in the United Nations or uh, state um, delegations to, 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 to countries, to Egypt or to India in the first place, I found that uh, um, Bosniaks, ha um, mainly Bosniaks, could have played a, a major ro role in, in helping contacts develop. Um, but uh, in, not as a people, but um, single persons who were active within the Yugoslav government and who um, um, who had um, who was somehow in, in, in how enhancing the efforts, not more than that, I think. And to find out really how it looked like, would one would have really to focus on these questions and to do a research. But at the same time, I'm not sure whether it will be for an article, perhaps, but not more than that. Um, what I found was a network um, um, of uh, Yug Yugoslav officials um, of Bosniak origin, mainly Bosniak, also an Albanian from Split region was important um, as, a, as a diplomat um, who took leading roles in, in diplomacy and in being part of, of the delegations. And also on the economic um, side, um, there, uh, there were people active there which easily concluded um, agreements with uh, Indian, um, um, the, the, the Yugoslavs very early on uh, got an, uh, uh, an economical agreement with India before, a uh, trade agreement with India before others did. And uh, I believe that the success in this somehow lies in this um, know-how, how to deal with them. So they were the first European state who achieved this. So there is something, but it's difficult to, we would have to, to do some, some research on this. There are also links to Egypt, uh, which are interesting, and which I couldn't uh, dismantle. Somehow they, um, they seem to have been going on before. So people from Bosnia going to Cairo for, to study. This is an important point, or uh, there is some kind of emigration, um, uh, which is probably linked with the exile government being in Cairo in the first place, or also some older links probably from the Ottoman times. This is also possible. But very, it's very difficult to find out more about it. Cuba. I didn't go into this period, I must admit. So, uh, of course, Cuba was very uh, important in the late 70s as a, as a as the place where the last um, um, summit of the non-aligned took place, where Tito participated and uh, where Tito played his last role to save his life work, his foreign affairs um, life work. And um, 
the fact is very clear. So basically what I can tell you, but there are others who would know more about this. For instance, um, Turko Jakovina has done a great study on, on this period. So I would uh, refer to him, Treća strana hladnog rata. Um, the basic thing is that um, Cuba acted so f uh, as a proxy to the Soviet Union in trying to take over the non-aligned movement in order to enhance uh, um, uh, Soviet um, influence in the United Nations. That is the core of the, of the, the, of the point. I hope I have all. Well, there will be a second round, so <laughs> something to add later on. Svetlana, please. I will also comment uh, on the way um, the principle of self-determination was uh, interpreted and used in this uh, debate uh, between uh, Romanian and the Russian side. Uh, also, there was not an equal step, uh, step debate um, um, because uh, Russia did not have official representatives in the Paris Peace Conference, and they, the Russian uh, immigrant representatives were occasionally invited to represent the, the interests of Russian people, so said, but uh, so there was not a constant presence of, of the Russians uh, at the conference, but not only in the conference I'm referring to, but during the, uh, the conference when, when this debate was, was very um, uh, intense. Um, so um, uh, Romania um, insisted on their historical rights of uh, over Bessarabia, right? Uh, um, the same language, the historical uh, um, um, tradition, uh, common uh, common history before 1812, and so on. And obviously, when when this uh, um, um, argument of self determination being very important at the, at the conference, um, they um, uh, showed wanted to wanted to um, uh, show that uh, the um, independence Independent bodies, um, legislative bodies um, of the region that voted for the union of Bessarabia with Romania were freely. Um, um, they were not freely elected, but they represented the whole population of Bessarabia. Indeed, there was a. Um, 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 Percentage, uh, minority percentage uh, represented their social groups, professional groups, uh, um, um, ethnic, um, so, uh, um, well, more political groups at those times. So, more or less, it was a um, uh, balanced uh, um, uh, body, but still, were, it was not freely elected. Uh, Romania insisted that uh, the fact that this uh, body um, freely um, uh, voted for the union of Bessarabia with Romania already signified that the self-determination of the region took place. And even more, uh, in uh, November 1919, where the first parliamentary elections took place in Romania, including Bessarabia, there were, um, and you can see this from, from, from letters uh, going um, um, back to Kishina and Paris and Bucharest. So you need uh, um, uh, um, um, like uh, advice uh, um, for, for uh, Romanian representatives at, at the conference. You need to climb that 72% of the population, of the um, population who had right to vote within Bessarabia, uh, expressed um, uh, its uh, um, free um, voting uh, during the first election. This already also reinforced the fact that uh, uh, population was was uh, um, accepting the Romanian regime, but uh, without you know saying in parentheses that the voting was compulsory um, according to the law. Um, as for the Russian side, um, it, it referred mainly to, to political rights and showing that Russian state was present before Romanian state was formed in the second half of 19th century, uh, 59-61, and um, but also uh, reinstating uh, the principle of uh, self-determination and, and showing the need of uh, people expressing its its will. So we don't have this term actually used in in, in this uh, correspondence and, and and the documents of the time. This people's will, uh, mainly used or people's voice even. So it sh shows that uh, um, uh, plebiscite would be the, the right mechanism to be reinforced in, in the province. But um, as you could see, political um, discussions are are present. Uh, uh, so um, even even uh, um, I, I mentioned a little bit about the plebiscite that it was uh, um, um, 
um, exemplified uh, to, to be to be in um, to be implemented only in four regions where the, the the majority of Romanian population lived, not on the entire Bessarabia. So it was a huge question mark, and uh, um, the, the the argument was uh, um, very uh, with a double uh, question mark because Russia, if uh, so, if population would um, vote. Uh, for Romania, for, for being part of Romania, Russia would give up these four districts, quote, it was big enough to make compromises of this kind. So, uh, unquote. So you, you see those self-determination as a, as a very um, uh, um, uh, losing um, uh, this principle, uh, um, obviously present in this debate, but uh, that did not have uh, too much uh, um, effect in this, uh, um, um, in this debate also in Paris, but um, as well in the province. As for autonomy, um, yeah, you are uh, very right. Uh, um, um, this um, autonomy um, plan, um, uh, project was uh, was also in Bessarabia, um, present from from the February Revolution on. Um, so um, Bessarabian autonomy within the Russian Federation it was uh, very dear to the to the local elite. As you see, uh, not a former imperial elite. I was talking, but even the representatives of the former elite, they kind of embraced this, uh, this um, uh, perspective in order to be reinstalled in power, to keep uh, somehow their presence in Bessarabia. Um, and um, uh, after, after the Bolsheviks uh, took power and uh, Ukrainian um, 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 autonomy and then independence of Bessarabia actually followed um, um, closely Ukrainian steps. Uh, and um, uh, indeed, uh, the union of Bessarabia with Romania was negotiated based on this principle of autonomy. And there were 10, uh, ten points um, reinforced uh, um, 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 in political, economical, especially agrarian law was very important in which um, um, autonomy play, played an important role. So local, uh, local uh, bodies had to vote the law which was, uh, comparing to other provinces, was uh, much more uh, uh, radical uh, than, um, than in, in other parts of Romania, um, after all, after, uh, after the parliament uh, um, um, uh, voted um, uh, the law and enforced the law. It was half done in Bessarabia already. Um, um, so, so uh, but uh, December 1918, it was the uh, abolition of autonomy, and in a, in a internal correspondence and diplomatic correspondence of the Romanian authorities, you can see how uh, how uh, they pushed uh, Bessarabian elite in order to give up this, this autonomy, showing that Paris is a crucial point, and if uh, we need to to go to Paris prepared. This is a word uh, prepared and showing that the population is supporting the Romanian nation state uh, inside Bessarabia, I mean. So uh, the elite was, was nearly forced uh, to give up. And this, this created a huge disappointment, disappointment within the local um, 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 elite that appeared uh, in 1718. And that is why I was saying that it brought together as a, um, as a um, huge surprise, um, former imperial elite and the local um, new, uh, let's say, elite together in Paris. So they are nearly, you know, uh, working together. And uh, obviously, the, the um, uh, argumentation is uh, is differing, and what they publish in the newspaper is differing. But against Romania, Romania was the main main enemy. So they united together the forces to to um, uh, counterbalance the Romanian presence at the Paris Peace uh, Conference. Hopefully, I, I answered. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Ulf Bonbar is the first. Um, uh, I've got a uh, question to Andrzej Kolarz. Well, first of all, with a little bit of imagination, I think we can uh, draw uh, some uh, links between uh, these uh, two papers uh, that uh, kind of focusing on self-determination and, uh, and Andrzej Kolarz's paper. It's obviously very helpful if you uh, want to become a nation that uh, enjoys the right of being considered a potential case for self-determination to have an army. That's uh, obviously quite useful. And uh, what I'm always for kind of surprising, and, and that therefore I liked your, your paper really, uh, really a lot. Uh, if you consider the what what makes a state a state, then of course 
borders is important, and there's a huge body of research on the drawing on borders after World War I, but also the monopoly on violence is an essential tenant of a state, and there's relatively little on that. Uh, although it's not, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion in, uh, in a situation after a war, uh, people, various people being under arms to establish the uh, monopoly of violence is really not that easy. And therefore, I think it's really good that uh, people like you are studying security forces, uh, which is really a very understudied subject in historical research on this region. Uh, so that was part rather of a comment than a question. But I have a question, a factual question, because I really have no, uh, no, not any clue at all about the uh, arrangement of security forces in uh, the first Czechoslovak Republic. What I found interesting, or what I got from your talk, is that the Gendarmerie was a, a rather inclusive uh, force employing also quite a number of former Austrian uh, officers and uh, people uh, from the German minority. But can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the sort of uh, division of labor between army, gendarmerie, and police force? Uh, who was the ministry who was responsible for the gendarmerie? Was it the Ministry of War or the Ministry of Internal? affairs, uh, what's about sort of a competition between these uh, different branches of security forces in terms of uh, 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 getting money from the, from the state. So that's not clear to me because I'm really ignorant for this. But I think it's interesting. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, in the room at this particular point? Yes, there are two questions in the front first row. So. Uh, Grover Meyer, Austrian journalist. I would uh, ask uh, about this uh, uh, gendarmerie. Did they have significant uh, uh, significant missions uh, uh, after their establishing? You mentioned some Hungarian incursions in Slovakia, but uh, or was it already enough that they were established that that already was in itself uh, establishing an order, or was the risk of disorder in in your country anyway not so? So high, like uh, what, I, what I know, f let's say, from Hungary, for instance. And if I may follow on that line, uh, which role did the gendarmerie actually play in including Slovakia and Carpatho Ukraine in the Czechoslovak state? And was there any opposition against it locally? Because that is this integration process. Um, apparently was rather smooth, but was it really? I would like to have that a bit elaborated. Please. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have, uh, we can go to answering the questions. Okay, first of all, the structure of the security forces. Uh, I mentioned already the gendarmerie and the, the army. Uh, there, uh, there was also so-called uh, financial guard or the Defensewache in German. Uh, it was also a relict of uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, structure of security forces. It was, uh, we can say, a border guard uh, that guarded mainly the state's borders. Uh, it was, um, it was. Uh, the, um, directed by, by the Ministry of Treasury. On the other side, uh, the army was, uh, of course, uh, under the Ministry of War, uh, as well as uh, was uh, the Gendarmerie at the very beginning. But already at the end of uh, 1918, the Gendarmerie was transferred under the Ministry of Interior. Um, and this ministry was of, also responsible for the state police force, which was um, uh, which wasn't very significant at the beginning because there were only two two state uh, police offices uh, in Prague and Brno in the biggest cities of the republic. Later, during uh, 1920s, uh, the structure of state police was um, uh, was strengthened. Uh, new police offices were um, established mainly in the in the cities, uh, in the borderland, and in the industrial towns of the republic. Um, 
the the rights and the competition competition of uh, both police and gendarmerie were very similar. Uh, there were uh, attempts to unify all the, the, the two forces, but uh, it uh, it didn't happen before the war. It happened after the Second World War in 1945. Uh, so the, the relations between gendarmerie and state police were often very complicated. There were uh, conflicts. Um, um, easily we can say that uh, the gendarmerie uh, could um, um, keep order everywhere instead of the, the districts of state police. The state police was in a few big cities and Everywhere else, uh, the gendarmes were responsible for keeping order. The second question, uh, I mentioned the mission in Slovakia. It was a very, very specific, uh, specific situation. Uh, it was at the beginning of November 1918. Uh, it means I in the situation when the state actually uh, started forming uh, the new army so that there were no other real, reliable security forces at the moment. Uh, later, during 1919-1920, uh, during the fights in Slovakia or uh, on the Polish border, uh, the gendarmerie closely cooperated with the army officials, of course. Uh, so, so the Slovakian case was uh, very specific. Uh, but uh, even in in the next years, uh, um, there the, there was a special institution of the of the so-called field gender field gender Mary, um, consisting of um, all the experienced gender Mary officers uh, uh, to, um, together with um, some uh, uh, army so together with some soldiers from the army and. Uh, uh, these uh, units um, were helping uh, to keep order in in the fi fighting areas in, in, around the battlefields in uh, in Slovakia. Uh, these units uh, were not usually um, participating exactly in the battles, but uh, they were ca catching deserters, spies, and so on. Uh, they were pro protecting the, the the terrain of the army, the, and uh, you ask about the the relation to the gendarmerie, about the opposition, mainly in the eastern part of the republic. Um, it's uh, a top it's the topic which is uh, not uh, very explored by the Czech historiography yet, um, uh, but. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, technically, uh, the Czech officials expected that uh, they will be welcomed uh, by the Slovakian and Carpathian Ruthenian peoples uh, as liberators from Hungarian rule. But, uh, but uh, actually, the people mainly in the country, in the villages, uh, uh, saw the Czech officials as uh, as new occupants and as new new force, as someone who's coming there here and who who is telling us what to do and what not to do. So um, the, there were cases of opposition, mainly in the first years. Uh, mm, but um, uh, there, there were also cases uh, of um, uh, cooperation of the, of the inhabitants uh, with Hungarian uh, paramilitary troops. Uh, the people were used to the, the Hungarian rule and many of them um, suppose that, uh, uh, that they they could uh, live in peace during the Hungarian rule, and they didn't know what to expect from from the Czech uh, soldiers and gendarmes. So so they rather helped the Hungarians. Actually, when I when I mentioned the first uh, mission of Czechoslovak gendarmerie to Slovakia to the city of Trnava in 1918. Uh, at first, uh, there um, there was a um, revolution of the local inhabitants in Trnava against the Czech uh, armed forces, and uh, the Hungarian army only used the opportunity and attacked, attacked the city. So, uh, if there are any other questions, okay, thank you. We have 
one time for one last round of questions. So please, yes. It's switch on. Okay, my name is Stepan Malkovich from Zagreb. One question to Mr. Kolarish. Was there any connection between uh, the members of pre-war uh, Sokol or Falcon um, athletic or gymnastic uh, associations with these gendarmerie, uh, gendarmerie units? Because in case of Croatia and Slovenia, these units had very important uh, role during these security problems because the, the, the troops didn't get back to homeland from the front until the beginning of the 19th. And secondly, to Natasha, uh, did you maybe notice uh, the plan of uh, famous Italian poet D'Annunzio during the Paris uh, Peace Conference concerning an um, anti-League of Nation because he launched uh, that plan to, to connect all uh, oppressed people, such as uh, Irish people, Palestinians, uh, some Arabs uh, people, and Bosniaks, Kosovars, as some kind of alternatives to, to, to plan. And uh, just a small comment on your, on your lecture. It's a little bit confusing uh, for me when you are using this uh, concept of uh, self-determination because for me it's uh, strictly connected with Wilsonian idea of democracy in practice to, 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 to nations and their right to uh, self-declaration. But in case of, I don't know, this uh, self, uh, this um, non-alignment uh, movement, we have, uh, for example, Titus, and he's a dictator. This is not a mirror of the democracy system, or I don't know, Haile Selassie, Gaddafi, and many other participants of this uh, movement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see if there are any other, any other guests. First row. Uh, yes, uh, uh, adding up to that uh, uh, use of the term self-determination, uh, uh, which I found even in your uh, uh, lecture something as a as a used pretext by leaders of this uh, of these uh, countries, which had uh, a more or less uh, abdominal democratic record. Uh, as an example, even in foreign policies of these countries, in 1956. One nation in uh, Central of Europe uh, claimed its right for self-determination, Hungary, and rose up against its own uh, Stalinistic uh, regime. And this was put down, not only, it was put down by the Soviet Union, but in complete, more or less complete, uh, accordance with Tito, Chu and Lai, and named them. Thank you for your questions. For uh, D'Annunzio, I didn't know. I will look it up, so it looks interesting. As for your second point um, uh, about Wilson and Tito being a dictator, yes, of course, the question is who was Tito, but I'm, in fact, not really interested in whether he was a dictator or not, so I hope at the end I will be... Uh, uh, what, what I want to find out is what did he really want. And uh, his link with self-determination is, uh, which I um, have elaborated in this um, context, is not really about Tito, but about the use of the slogan of self-determination of peoples. And he used it very early on. And it was part of the communist talk about how to enforce if you want to instrumentalize it, you can have it, you look at it as a kind of uh, how, a, a means to achieve a world revolution, of course. So when, when, when Lenin uses the term, he has certainly in mind to, to free the people, in other words, to, to achieve world revolution. So it also uh, depends on, on which side of the medal you look at the question. So, um, but um, there is a colleague in Zurich who is now uh, retired who has done a large um, research on, on, on self-determination of, uh, on the right of self-determination of peoples in, in German. I think he has also published in English, this is of Jörg Fisch, um, the Selbstbestimmungsrecht der Völker. 
die Domestizierung einer Illusion. And if there is one historian who has really looked at the question, then uh, you must refer to Jörg Fisch. And there is, of course, also the wonderful work of, of Eris Manela, the Wilsonian moment, uh, especially if you, if you again mention uh, uh, Wilson. And so the Wilsonian moment, self-determination and the international origins of anti-colonial nationalism. This would be one of the reference books about uh, the, the question. Um, Hungary 1956, yes, of course, this is very important, and this is one, uh, I have made a case study on, on, the, on the Hungarian uprising in 56, which is um, um, published in English uh, in a short version in, in, a, in a collected volume I, uh, which has just appeared, about uh, which I edit my, edited myself together with uh, Harald Fischer Tine and Nada Boschkowska, The non aligned Movement and the Cold War. There is also um, a German version about to be published in Südostforschungen, which is a little bit larger, which deals really with, the, with uh, this, uh, um, how Tito and Nero in the, in the early stages of their um, relationship tried to, sorry, um, parting from what I believe to be an in, uh, uh, um, 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 an idealistic move just after the Brioni Agreement um, to support the Hungarian uprising and then being duped uh, by, by Khrushchev and uh, the Soviets. And they all use this, this notion of self-determination of peoples, but they mean something very different. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the key, I think, observations which comes out here is also that the idea of self-determination, of course, has both a democratic and a not necessarily democratic connotation. This is not a this is not a, in, an inherent link between the two between the two concepts, and I think this is part of the the tension, of course. I mean, there's the tension which Karl Bethke was referring to earlier, as you know, who is the self and the determination part, because uh, which is often is you know, is it the self kind of same kind of self-determination when we're talking about peoples, uh, nations, or communities in, in, in Eastern, Southeastern Europe, uh, which are part of a larger multinational empire, uh, and people who are part of colonies, which goes back, of course, to the question of, you know, is the colonial framework the one which is appropriate? But, of course, we have the reverse here, where, in fact, the con concept of self-determination first comes up in Central and Southeastern Europe, and only then becomes transferred to the to the former colonies. Um, um, so that's one tension, I think. And the other tension is, is, is again, the one between uh, the democratic element of the self-governing part uh, and the, the fact that this is not inherently understood to be such, certainly not in the way in which Lenin understood self-determination. Um, we have a few more minutes, so um, I uh, will give the opportunity for a last, a very quick round of Questions and I think Karl Bethke has his hand up, so we can and the microphone. Make it more there. clear. Um, communism is not so much about enlightenment; it's about property. And and we can ask ourselves, what about with self de de determination? Is this um, only an idealistic idea? I have to be free from a culture or so on. Or, as I would suggest, and as you all know, are there also some material in uh, interests implicated? because of the question of property, for example, or because of uh, the question of jobs in bureaucracies. Yeah? It's not, uh, when uh, the situation, when uh, the, uh, you can become a policeman or whatever, a professor, just because you have the right ethnicity. And, and this is a material resource. Uh, and, uh, you know, in so far, I meant that, that you put the whole question of national self-determination uh, a bit too Idealistic. You sh I mean, we should here in, um, add an element of uh, materialist critique, and and, and so far the, 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 we can compare both um, um, questions. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the question is: is the, is the structure of the property, which is at question, is is this the same? Uh, well, is, is their position in the society the same? So. Okay, thank you. Just see if there are any last questions otherwise. If not, then I'll give a chance to all three speakers for a last brief comment. Okay. 
I understand what you mean, but this was not the question which was interesting me, so I didn't look at it. But um, the idealistic touch you perhaps feel is about my approach to India. So when I started to research on India, then of course you start with um, um, the freedom movement in India, which departs from Gandhi, and this is a very interesting, uh, idealistic approach. And I also feel this very idealistic approach by um, believing communist um, activists. They really believed in this, and they did not want property. They want to uh, this appropriate to nationalize the properties of the rich. So yes, of course, it is about properties, and and again of of gaining property. And when you look at Khrushchev, he wants to gain control, and he does it by the means of of uh, of self determination of peoples. And so does um, uh, so does Mao also as well. Um, on the other hand, when you look at Nehru, he very much was influenced and believed in the ideals of Gandhi. And this is why he was duped in the end, because he couldn't make the, he couldn't not believe in the sincerity of Chinese approaches in the first place. And he also did believe in the sincerity of Tito, what he told to him. And he was very much, in, uh, he was very much impressed by Tito as, um, as a as a hero of the war, as were all, uh, or, or, as were many uh, um, 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 many em eminent um, British uh, diplomats and politicians at the time, and that's why they supported Tito because they admired his way of fighting for the freedom of the South Slavs, although he was a communist. So we could go on discussing this, but I think it takes us perhaps a bit too far, but. I hope I so, uh, you you get got my point of what my approach is. Thank you. Okay, there was a question about the Sokol Union. It was a very influential Czech uh, sporting and nationalist organization that played a significant role during the First World War because the Czech volunteer units, uh, both in France and Russia, were uh, established mainly by the Sokol members. Uh, later, after the war, the so-called volunteer troops uh, fought uh, against, against the Hungarian troops in Slovakia. Uh, so th this organization was uh, strongly connected with the Czech uh, um, uh, fight for self-determination. Uh, um, and uh, it played uh, a great role in the army in the... Um, interwar period uh, when uh, many army officers uh, were uh, also Sokol members and the uh, soldiers were training together with the Sokols in their, in their parades and so on. Uh, but uh, in the gendarmerie uh, um, uh, the, the members uh, shouldn't uh, participate in Sokol in, and in uh, other sporting organizations. Uh, because of uh, the, the attempts to uh, secure the a political system system in the gendarmerie, um, uh, the gendarmes were allowed to participate only in uh, some war veteran unions um, and in in uh, some organizations which were connected with their profession. For example, uh, the. Um, uh, uh, associations of um, uh, ki kinologists and so on, uh, but uh, they were not allowed to be member of Sokol. Uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, this caused a huge media debate uh, in the first year of Czechoslovak independence, when a nationalist uh, newspaper protested uh, against this decision of Gendarmerie Command. Uh, they argue that um, the gendarmes are uh, free citizens of, of the, the Democratic Republic and they should be allowed uh, to participate in uh, Czech nationalist organizations, but um, actually um, nothing changed at, after the protest. Um, in, uh, in one uh, comment, the, the national problematic in the army was mentioned. Um, um, in the Czechoslovak case, there are several studies, uh, books and articles about this uh, topic. Um, uh, probably the, the um, most um, uh, 
the, the biggest uh, publication about this topic is from um, Austrian historian Martin Sikert, uh, published about 10 years ago, I think. So that's all for me. Okay, thank you. No specific question to answer, but uh, what came to my mind um, in this uh, overall discussion is that um, uh, very little is known about the use of the concept uh, of self-determination uh, during the immediate uh, post-World War I period, and especially in Eastern Europe. And, um, and, and the way it was used in political, it came into political rhetoric, and the way it came in daily rhetoric, and what was used in, in a newspaper papers and then as a um, as a illuminating concept for for people um, but interpreted very variously so this uh, this is a concept is um, a good uh, uh, idea to to um, uh, research as a begriffs geschichte and and the way it w it is used uh, um, in connection with other concepts which are uh, also appeared on on a regional scene at that moment like occupation liberation um, um, uh, and which are present up to today. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, this is a very a very useful observation in many ways because um, one of the striking phenomena, especially being at other panels which have looked more at the beginnings of the war, uh, of self-determination is nowhere on the agenda. The, the issue is repression. The issue is uh, some ideas of national unification. But the terminology of self-determination is nowhere to be found, of course. And even, even the political ideas behind it were certainly there, but they didn't predominate, uh, at least in general. And it's quite a transformation, and it's interesting to see how these concepts of self-determination come from the outside, both from the Soviet as well from the American side, applied to an area where, where in fact, there were ideas of national unification, but certainly... Um, they were then framed and legitimized, and this is an interesting question, the legitimization strategy of self-determination uh, in, in this period, really, um, and to look at that in, in greater detail. So I would like to thank the, the panelists for their contributions, and I would like to thank all of you for having, um, having the, 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 the strength uh, after the second long day uh, to be here sitting until, uh, until the very end, and I think the reward is called dinner. Um, uh, and uh, so please uh, join me in giving a big applause uh, uh, to our speakers. <laughs> Do not forget, tomorrow we begin again at 8.30. This is... Uh, Yes, 12 hours tomorrow. So do get strength today in the evening.